You are listening to CFBU 103.7 FM, St. Catharines. We are here at the Fine Grind at 37 James Street in downtown St. Catharines. It's a beautiful, nippy Saturday morning out there. And joining us is Shandor at falvey Shandor is the founder of the Brock Bug and has a journalism diploma from Niagara College, is a graphic artist and web designer, and he's joining me here today for a little bit of chat about what's going on at Brock with Busu. So thanks for coming by. Thanks, Deborah. I'm on Twitter at, at Brock Bug. You are here because there is a referendum happening at Brock University looking for approval from the students to make changes to the BUSU constitution. And the change is being sold as being necessary to fit into the new regulations for the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. Those changes were implemented in 2010, but they don't actually come into play until at least 2020. They're forecasting 2020. So their lawyer has recommended that they make changes to their constitution and their bylaws, and that's really what we're here to talk about. However, before we get into that, there's a couple issues here. One is whether the claim that they need to make these changes because of changes in the regulations is valid. Then the other part of this is the accountability and transparency of the student union itself. And I think that's kind of where you are coming from. You, over the years, have questioned things that have gone on, in particular with referendums and how those uh, things have run. So let's assume for the time being, unless you have proof otherwise, that these changes are required. And you have done some digging. You mentioned that you sat down with Robert Hilson recently to discuss this. How did that discussion go and what did you find out? Well, the question is, is BUSU actually required to comply with law? Or is that sort of a cover story so that people don't ask questions about the impact on representation? In my recent reports, one's called Brave New BUSU. I raise the issues about the transparency, accountability, and representation that will be in place after the referendum. So, in my view, they have sufficiently presented evidence that there are legal requirements that they must follow. So when I sat down with Mr. Hilson, and it was all on the record, and it's all in my report, uh, fully quoted, uh, he makes specific references to the specific, both the Corporations Act, which is a provincial law, and the as yet unenacted Ontario Nonprofit Act. So the campaign is not actually referencing ONCA, the Ontario Not-for-Profit Act. They're only referencing the Corporations Act. And they're saying that currently, BUSU having BUSAC make bylaws is a liability to BUSU's board of directors. So if if something goes wrong, it's the board of directors, actual individuals, fiduciarily responsible for, I suppose, the mistakes and the mishaps of the bylaws, which is what the whole focus of my recent report was on. That only implies that what has BUSAC been doing to drop the ball, to create the liabilities? Well, the thing is, in my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that has not changed. I mean, the board of directors of any organization is always the top line in terms of liability. It doesn't matter who does what below that. They have always been that. So how is this different, essentially? It's unclear exactly how it's different. In the last 18 months, there's been significant issues with referendum fairness. So last year, for example, the engagement levy referendum, which was $100 per first year and creates a fund of about $400,000 a year, that referendum was admittedly an unfair referendum. So the issues were Brock TV equipment and footage and computers and staff were used by BUSU to create a great campaign, but a completely unfair campaign. The bylaw specifically says that campaigns have to be limited to $500, but the value of that campaign must have been much more than that in terms of the equipment, the footage, and that's just the Brock TV side. Then they post vote yes to their social media campaign, which is again, not allowed and has never happened before. So Busu broke the rules and then got the money. And then a year later are now rearranging the entire accountability system. So if an individual like me, imagine I was a student, came to BUSAC and said, hey, I think this is wrong and that you need to be accountable, in the future, that person needs to go to the board of directors instead and not go to BUSAC. Because under the amendment, BUSAC will no longer be required to hold the executives accountable. So if you have a problem with an executive, you could have gone to BUSAC and you said, ah, this executive did this, what are you guys going to do about it? Well, now they're literally 
can't do anything about it except, well, they could make a recommendation. But it's up to the board of directors to both receive reports and to hold officers accountable. And that's actually a very substantial change in the, in the political culture of Busu. Let's go back a second to the fairness of the referendum campaigns. More often recently, there seems to be no no side or no yes side. So whatever side Busu takes, no right. one steps up to take the other side. However, yeah. in the particular referendum that you are referencing, the one yes. that was unfair, there actually was a student running the other side. And the reason that, that you point out that it was perceived as being unfair is because that poor student did not have access to Busu social media, did not have access to Brock TV, even though Brock TV said if he'd contacted us, they would have done something. That was really the issue in that case, is you, as the outsider, was pointing out that, look, you've got this poor student doing what he can with the resources he can yeah. in the limited budget that they're allowed. Versus time. this Yes, versus this giant entity, multi-million dollar corporation, who's making... A proposal that's five years old, because this was the third time they had tried to do this very same funding initiative. Yes. So that was the unfairness of that particular situation. And you asked a number of questions during that time, and I believe were accused of harassing or something, some kind of language like that. And in the end, they ultimately responded to you and said, well, yes, actually, there were some unfair aspects to this. Is that correct? Well, they never responded to me. Uh-huh. They responded to the other campaign. Because when the I wrote a report in October of 2018 asking, did Busu tilt the referendum? And I went through the bylaws and in a pretty detailed way and quoted bylaw by bylaw how this doesn't fit. So the no campaign, which at the time was an individual, a student named Mel Genser, also created a complaint. So what this means is when there are two campaigns, a yes and a no campaign, the bylaws are written for those cases. They're actually not even written for when there's only one campaign because there's no one to be unfair to if there's no other campaign. And Busu executives also used Busu email addresses and email lists to contact Busu clubs to do campaigning while that particular individual was on a leave of absence. And none of this is, it's all forgotten now. At the time, the Busu elections team released an infraction investigation report. And in that report, there are multiple admissions that it is in fact unfair, but the unfairness is due to precedent which is, I think, just makes matters worse. It's like, yeah, I stole the cookies, but I've always been stealing the cookies, so what's the problem? If my understanding is correct, at the time when they gave that response, the implication was that they're going to try and correct this and try and rectify this situation. Recently, in October, you appeared at BUSAC a couple of times and asked questions during question period, and one of the questions that you asked was, what have you done about this in the meantime, and what was the response that you got? The letter from late October 2018 promised to work arduously. I love the quote, arduously, because they didn't actually work arduously. But with the benefit of the doubt, I'm not going to just go out and say they didn't do anything. I showed up to BUSAC twice asking specific questions about what had been done. In what way has BUSU been accountable to the promises made by their own election team? Again, the context is millions and millions of dollars are being put into a BUSU fund. And they did it in a unfair referendum and in order to appease the people who they were upsetting at the time last year they promised to work arduously to address bias and unfairness in referendums so it's a natural follow-up question one year later what did you guys do about it and there was nothing that was shown so if they had conversations in their governance elections and nomination committee if they had conversations they haven't shown those conversations and it had never turned into any uh, legislative changes. Of course, I don't actually think legislative changes are required. In one of my reports, I say, well, it's the cooks, not the cookbook. So the meal had gotten messed up, and this is sort of a metaphor about the unfair referendum, and the chief reporting officer blamed the deficiency on the bylaws themselves instead of on their own team. And that's just a way of kicking the can down the road. And so here we are down the road one year, and we have a whole new team, but the team isn't willing to verbalize any recognition that there is unfairness. I asked the current director of government operations if BUSU recognizes a natural power imbalance between the yes side, BUSU, and any random no side, and he wasn't even willing to comment. He wasn't even willing to say, well, that's a good point, that's something we're looking into, and that is concerning. I always want to assume that people are, well, that they're not 
being uh, malicious, that there's no malintent, that it's just simply naivete and a novice approach that they don't know what they're doing. So year after year, we have young people, young students who don't necessarily know what they're doing, which is why I feel it's very important that you have a, a strong critical media that's willing to remind people what happened last year. This is where the whole idea of institutional memory comes into play. Often, when you bring up these issues, like you will you take a bit of a hiatus and then you see something going on over here, and you think, okay, somebody needs to raise the red flag, and you, you do that on Twitter and elsewhere. Inevitably, when you do that, someone will say something like, dude, you don't even go to Brock anymore. Why do you care? Why are you bothering with this? Like, why don't you just, like, disappear kind of thing? What's your response to that? Why are you bothering? Well, they say that a, a writer should write what they know. And my past experience at BUSU, at Brock University, has given me more personal knowledge than most people have about BUSU just at all. My student status has never really been something that's held me back because from an intellectual perspective, you have a, a nonprofit corporation under the authority of the province of Ontario not fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities. So I don't need to be a student to point out that there's a, an unhealthy democratic environment. You don't need to live in a house to put out a fire. If your neighbor's house is on fire, you go and you try and help put out the fire. You don't need to live in that house. So sure, I, I could follow up on other corruption, quote unquote, corruption in the world. But this is the one I happen to be most familiar with. And it's also an environment where I've demonstrated nobody else is really devoted to, to actually discussing it. The legitimate student media entities, and I'm specifically talking about Brock Press, doesn't it does bother me that people say this, but they're actually a vocal minority. The mass majority of people who are exposed to the information I present are quiet. They don't say anything at all. So if there are a few people who say like, hey, you need, you need to be quiet, you need to do this or that, uh, you need to stop doing this because you're not a student, it has never slowed me down before. The role of student meeting, us included, should be to question, to at least report on, and then when necessary, question things which may not seem right. And you have discussed in the past and acknowledged the idea of a power imbalance. So when the entity that you need to question as student media has the ability to either pull your funding or make your life very, very difficult, there could be a chance that people are not going to question that. Uh, and you've had you know, private conversations with people from other media, not us, but other media about this very thing, that th that was their understanding, that if they questioned things, they could wind up like us, essentially, without any funding. So now that we have the ability to choose the ancillary fees, so choose whether they want to fund the Brock Press or parts of Brock TV, one would wonder, okay, does that mean that now the press might have more freedom to start doing the kinds of investigative journalism that you seem to think that they want to do. Because that seems to have been your ongoing complaint with the student media, is that they, they just don't tackle the issues, essentially. That is absolutely my ongoing complaint with student media, and is in fact why I founded the Brock University Gadfly, and why I founded it as an alternative journalistic entity. And this goes back to 2013. When a proposal is made by BUSU, the proposal isn't then picked up and reported or criticized by the press. So weeks and weeks and weeks go by without Brock Press even pointing people in the direction of a proposal. And that happened with the student life fee in 2013. And it's happened over and over and over, over again. And it's, it's happening right now. So this constitutional amendment, we first found out about it on September 25th. And Brock Press didn't report on it until October 28th. That's over a month, and it's after the deadline for the No campaign. So, you know, you have a $250,000 a year organization, plus advertising, whatever they make. That's student funding, and the constituency aren't being represented through the pages. We can speculate that the reason for this is because the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. That there are consequences to stepping on toes. And if the powers that be at BUSU have a particular way they expect things to go, speculating, well, could receive some consequences. And so I think that could be something that limits the Brock Press. It also has to do with how esoteric and difficult the subject matter is itself. It took me years, a year at least, to learn how BUSU works. And then it took me two years to learn 
that they're not necessarily going to hear what you say and you got to say it twice and you got to say it three months later and you got to come back. All these things. It took me a while. So we're dealing with full-time students who are paid 12 hours a week to be the journalist of the entire new school newspaper. So I've learned not to assume that there's mal intent or negative intent in the deficiencies, but that doesn't mean I'm going to ignore the deficiencies. Which is exactly it. They are part-time and uh, they've got a limited amount of knowledge about politics in general, time to pursue these things, and then they're dealing with the, all the other issues as well. And I guess, you know, in the past, uh, people who uh, have worked at the press have felt attacked by you, especially when you start saying things on social media. So I guess my question to you is, you have these journalistic skills, you have the, the knowledge, this historical knowledge. Have you ever actually approached incoming people from a new year of the Brock Press to say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I have this knowledge, do you want to sit down and do a workshop on maybe how you do investigative journal? And I'm serious about that. Have you ever, have you ever done that? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I have. I've, um, I popped in a couple of years ago to talk to the new press, the new editor of the Brock Press and introduce who I was and offer my perspective. None of my emails have ever been returned. We don't have a great rapport. And I think that's in large part because I have founded myself as the opposition to the Brock Press. So I didn't, I'm not shy about that. One of the reasons I'm still a committed gadfly is because I made a pledge in 2013 to then Brock Press editor that I would continue to embarrass the Brock Press. And when I say embarrass, I mean, I'm going to do the job you should be doing. And I've done that over and over again. I've scooped the Brock Press over and over again. I've never been paid for it. They're getting paid. Probably not enough to do the job. But over and over again, I've been able to scoop the Brock Press. And all I do is, you know, read, go, watch the meetings, read, read the minutes. I send emails. Rarely I get replies. But now I'm back in Niagara, so I get better replies. So, yes, I have made some efforts to reach out to them. I've contacted this year's news editor. There's not much interest in hearing from, from me. And obviously those investigative journalism skills are transferable. In other words, if there was a Brock student in first year listening to this right now, and they were not necessarily taking journalism, but thought that this is something that they could pursue, this is a good way to get started, is to start following things and learning and, and trial and error kind of thing. What advice would you, would you give them? Well, the first thing, of course, is write it down. Identify what the issue is and write it down. Always cite your sources of information. So I may have a slightly biased perspective on what I think BUSU is or isn't, but my reporting is still very good because it always cites the source of my, of my claims. I mean, I had two years of journalism experience in college and did very well there. So I have that experience that it's really hard to beam two years of, of college training to uh, someone who's becoming interested in journalism. I don't know if I have the best advice because what level of success have I had? Well, the level of success I've had has been in the past, students have heard my reports or seen my reports and gone to council and spoken up. In 2018, there was a student who read my reports. Uh, we got in touch and he went and made a speech at BUSAC. They completely ignored him, like absolutely ignored him. So there's a real challenge for students when they look at the precedent of what happens when you do stand up. And that's one of the reasons I'm still engaged because there's an institutional advantage. All they have to do is wait us out. I could spend six months and then there's turnover. They get new elections, they get a new school year and everything's forgotten. And so the stick to I think is necessary. You can't just show up once, ask one question and go away and hope that you made an impact. You have to show up year after year, which isn't something that most people really should have to endure themselves to. Which brings us to today and you talking about precedent, because and this is what you encountered basically last year, right? You questioned something and they said, well, this is precedent, right? What was precedent was using Busu's social media in campaigning. That was the specific thing that they, I believe they were referring to being precedented. 
We actually are here today to talk about the constitutional amendment. The idea is to change the constitution because they want to bring it in line with the new Ontario Not-for-Profit Act. And that involves transferring power, which is really why we're here today, because that has raised some red flags for you in particular about transparency and accountability. So let's talk about that. What are your concerns? Let's assume that this is a legitimate thing that they need to do. What are your concerns about what's going to happen after if it goes through? Yeah, so as I go over some of this, it's important that we can reference to my reports just so that there's different learning styles and some people may not be able to learn the details from us just talking about it. So I've written a report called Brave New Busu, which is on Medium and can be found on my Twitter page at Brockbug. So when it comes to issues of questions of the impact of accountability, transparency and representation, the constitutional amendment has an impact on those things. Currently, under the current constitution, which is going to be renamed to bylaw number one, it says that officers of the corporation, which are the elective executives, are accountable to BUSAC. If the amendment passes, they'll be accountable to the board of directors. This may seem like a simple change, but it's actually a large political cultural change because if there's an issue with an executive, concerned party or student has to convince the board of directors to take action instead of convincing BUSAC. BUSAC is a council system. It has an open question period, whereas the board of directors is a little bit more, they meet wherever they need to meet. There aren't necessarily cameras. It's culturally, maybe they could be more transparent, but right now they're not. So the theater of politics being like, hey, that executive did something wrong. If a student was to come and say that, the audience don't have a vote anymore. So if you go to council, you wouldn't be able to vote. Oh, we need to do X, Y, Z about that. I'm not fully explaining it correctly, which is why, again, hope that people will turn to the to the reports. Also changed in the amendment is reports. So currently about a third of the meeting, some meetings is the each of the executives going through the reports at council and explaining what they've been up to. That is no longer going to be required. So if they make reports at council, it'll only be a courtesy. And at some point, if they don't have the report ready, and someone says, hey, where's your report? They'll be like, well, we don't have to. We gave a report to the board of directors. We don't have to give you a report. And maybe for a year or two, they'll be, they'll follow through on the courtesy of, of giving it to BUSAC. But maybe in a couple of years, hey, this is what the bylaw says. Why are we even doing this? Suddenly there's no reports at BUSAC. That's quite possible. And again, Brock TV, under some efforts, ended up recording a lot of the BUSAC meetings. They come to the meetings. They have three, two or three staffers, two or three cameras, and they live cast it from BUSAC. That's a huge amount of transparency that I can't rely on the future of the board of directors being nearly as transparent. When you have a board meeting, it is rare to go in camera and you only go in camera when you're supposed to use in camera, when you're dealing with contractual things or personnel issues, things of a sensitive nature. And I noticed a number of years ago that suddenly, Every board meeting, there was an in-camera, like it was almost a line item where there was this, an in-camera session, which I found to be very odd because obviously the in-camera bits don't wind up in the minutes. So you raised recently, whether it was on your medium or wherever you raised it, about that, the fact that the norm up until today was that you have these open BUSAC meetings where people, even like yourself, who are not students, can go and ask open questions, or if people have concerns, they can raise it. It can be discussed in BUSAC. Brock TV can film it. The Brock Press is there. Now you are moving things over to a board meeting that has like seven or eight members. Whether they're open or not is a whole thing, but what happens when you have these in-camera sessions? So that's part of what you're raising is, is the whole a transparency issue. Absolutely. The transparency, accountability, and representation. So that third point, representation, is simple numbers. There are 31 elected BUSAC councillors and four elected officers, meaning 35 people write the bylaws currently. 35 elected representatives write the bylaws currently. Under the amendment, it'll only be the seven members of the board of directors. So that is a lot less democratic representation. And importantly, the board of directors elections are they were one person races. So three or actually four, but three of the student at larges on the board of directors acclaimed to their seats. They didn't have any campaign to oppose them. And these are campaigns that are not very popular. So what we're now learning is that the most powerful seats at BUSU 
are the least popular elections. But to be fair, there is a chance that once this passes, that that will also change because students may now realize, okay, well, where I can make real change is at the board level. So I'm not even going to bother to run for BUSAC. I'm, I'm going to go straight for the board. So there's a chance that that might change. That I you... think that they're conceiving BUSAC as part of the ladder towards the board. So one of the remaining powers of BUSAC is that you can fill, as a BUSAC counselor, you could fill a temporary seat on the board of directors. So I think you're right that it could change, but maybe it's just my own, my own cynicism. It's cynicism based in the current lack of discourse. So who's going to push for that? The Brock Press hasn't even reported on this at all, let alone pushed for representation. At the BUSAC meetings in October, you raised some questions and you also provide a transcript of those questions and answers on your site. And during those questions, you asked to the group, but I believe the current president answered, can you explain to us, after the changes, what really is the role of BUSAC going to be if they're no longer responsible for some of these things? Yeah, they're currently responsible for writing the bylaws of the organization, and the bylaws of the organization include defining the terms of elections and referendums. So over the last few years, when I've been criticizing BUSU for not following its bylaws, I'm specifically referring to Bylaw 400 and previously Bylaw 401, the elections and the referendum bylaws. Those are the legislative documents which will now become the responsibility of the Board of Directors, and the Board of Directors will be able to amend them. But they won't be known as bylaws. They'll be known as board procedures. There's only going to be one bylaw, Bylaw number 1. Everything else will become a board procedure, which is interesting. And the reason it's a dis differentiation is because According to Mr. Hilson, in order for a bylaw to be ratified, it not only passes at the referendum, but it needs to pass at, get this, an annual general meeting. However, it's my understanding that the Corporations Act changes will allow for electronic voting if the entity chooses to allow that. So if they really need to pass something, rather than expecting people to come in person. And you know that in the past, attendance has been pretty horrible at those AGMs, and they need, uh, what's, what's the percentage now that they need? 2% of the FTE, which is a lot of people. So there is a chance that they might change how they do that if they want those things to pass. Yeah, and it's not confirmed yet, but I'm something I'm going to need to follow up on. Are they going to need to ratify the amendment? So they have the referendum, but then are they going to need to ratify the bylaw itself, or is that... I think that'll count. That'll be their ratification of the new bylaw in, in October. So around 2013, 2014, in that area, there were a number of constitutional amendments which were pretty challenged at the time. People had some issues with those constitutional changes. One of them involved the uh, number of signatures that you had to get on a student-led petition. The other was the amount of quorum required for a student-led petition, and I believe there was some other change at the time. Now, flash forward, post this referendum, if it passes... If a student wants to make some changes to the Constitution, let's say they want to change the number of signatures that are required on a student-led petition because they don't agree with what was done back in 2013, how would they even start that process if that change is being made by the, the Board of Directors? Well, based on my experience, I think that the answer would be that there's petition potential. So if you have a petition to change the bylaws and it's it's a uh, the petition reaches quorum then the organization the institution has to respect that petition and i don't know what happens after that though but the board of directors is the one who there is the entity who's responsible for amending the bylaw itself if the bylaw is amended it needs to go through an annual general meeting or a digital equivalent if the board ultimately has the power on whether they change you know, bylaws or policy, board policies, do they have to respect that petition? Just because a student says, hey, I want you to change X, doesn't mean the board, the board can look at it and say, you know what, we've looked at your suggestion to change mm -hmm. X, but we as the board have said, that's not in the best interest of this organization. So, no. Well, those powers uh, defined by the Constitution uh, haven't been touched. So if it was the a certain way prior it'll be the same way in the future the powers that were touched are visible uh, in the appendix and on the appendix you can see where they've written red lines through it 
So my focus has been on what is actually has a red line through it, what has been deleted or omitted and where those things have been moved. The things you're asking about weren't necessarily touched. And um, on that note, in your discussion at BUSAC, there was a point where you said, is X going to be affected? And the response you got was, no, X isn't going to be affected. And you had the finger pointing to the red line that says, well, X is going to be affected because it's being yeah. crossed out. So that's an open que- or a, a lingering question because it wasn't addressed during the question period. But the question was, committees have been removed from BUSAC's power. Where did they go? Will BUSAC have committees? The response was, committees weren't removed. Well, they were. I haven't... Uh, haven't followed up with it and be like, so what's really going to happen here? I would assume that the reason certain things were removed is because they're already implied by the provincial law. So you don't necessarily need to define that the board of directors will have a committee because board of directors have committees. So you don't need a, a, in the bylaw to say board of directors is going to have the committees now. So they removed it from BUSAC. And I think it's just implied that committees will be controlled by the board. Okay, so to wrap up, what are your concerns right at this moment if this passes? And what do you suggest that students do post the referendum if they still have concerns about this? Well, what troubles me mostly is the lack of discourse. And this has actually been the thing that's troubled me the most in general uh, when I engage in the, the Brock democratic political process is there appears to be a lack of discourse. Um, Busu itself didn't do any what I call due diligence in exposing this issue to the public. Uh, I asked, why not write a press release? They said, we don't write press releases. And I think that's very telling. There's really no reason not to write a press release. University educated students should be able to explain themselves. It's as simple as that. If you have a proposal, propose it, say it out loud, explain where your reasons are coming from. And that's that. I don't think this conversation has been intended to sway the results one way or the other. And given their need to comply with the provincial legislation, it's actually difficult to say, oh, you should vote no. The only reason you should vote no, if you should vote no, is because as demonstrated in the process that just took place, there was no back and forth. So who wrote the appendix? The lawyers wrote the appendix. So the new bylaws with the red lines where delete certain portions and put out of the super certain portions. The representatives never had any pushback. I asked them, was there any pushback? They never said, oh, we need to keep these powers. These are important to us. They just let the lawyers do whatever they wanted. Now, maybe the lawyers care about student representation. Maybe, maybe they don't. So the only reason you would vote no, if you would vote no, is because you'd expect it to come back in February. And maybe in February, they would have had demonstrated a little bit of the negotiation or given a vision for what the future of representation looks like. What I think we've shown in, in my reports is that the, the process wasn't a discourse. It wasn't, here's our problem. Here's what we're thinking of doing. What do you think? It was, this is what we're going to do. The first words out of the board of directors mouth on the September 25th presentation was we are having a referendum. It wasn't, we have an issue and this is the process that we've gone through. We didn't like that we had to change the bylaws. They didn't say that. They don't mind at all that they have to change the, the bylaws, which is what, really what the story is to me. The story isn't a power grab or a conspiracy. The story is a, a lack of discourse, rational discourse. That's my perspective. So moving forward, what would a, a student or another concerned party want to do is just simply well, you're going to have to follow them up on their promises. So the current chair of the board of directors promises his word promise to review representation in the future. So a, a counselor said, Hey, there's only seven people on the board. Are we going to increase the size of the board? And the answer was, Oh, we'll have a review. And I hope they do. But one year from now, if we start asking, Hey, what's happening with that review, it may go the same way as what happened with the working arduously to address referendum unfairness. It'll just get swept under the rug and forgotten. And that's, that's just a story. I mean, I'm here just to, only as a, a storyteller. I'm not really trying to sway or influence the referendum. 
We've been chatting with Shander Liggett Falvey. He is the founder of The Brock Bug. If people would like to find out more about these issues, you have published pretty much verbatim the transcript of your questions at BUSAC and the answers that you received. If people would like to find out more about that, how do they find you? My primary f- platform is Twitter. So I'm on Twitter fairly frequently at Brock Bug. And that's short for Brock University Gadfly. And I just want to quickly touch upon what a gadfly is. A gadfly is a reference to a Socrates quote. The quote is to the effect of that a large institution is very slow and the gadfly bites it, which makes it move around a little. If people don't understand why I do what I do, check out the definition of the word gadfly. So it's B-U-G, Brock Bug, or the Brock University gadfly. And you also post some things on Medium, and, and you've got those links on Twitter. Yeah, so all of my links are on Twitter, as well as I, because I understand people don't necessarily want to click a link and then scroll for 10 minutes on an article. I then take pieces of that article and I repurpose it into different social media platforms. And this conversation will be something that I think will be helpful to people because of the different learning styles. Some people need to hear a conversation instead of read it themselves. So I really hope that this will be helpful in raising some awareness of the topics. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Deborah.